Hello, welcome to Scrolling, a podcast about the Elder Scrolls Online. I'm Ket Sparrowhawk, and this is episode number two. Okay, let's talk about some patch notes. Uh, so on the last on the last episode, we talked about part of the patch notes, right? We we talked about the racial balance changes, and we, that's about the only. Uh, part of the PTS patch notes we touched on, <clears throat> just because it was such a, it's such a big topic all by itself. Uh, it w- it would have been way too much to try to cover all of it in that one episode. Um, this info is like a week old by this point, but I figure this being, you know, me being new to podcasting, it makes makes great material for me to practice on. Uh, plus, PTS is uh, under maintenance right now, so. Uh, Probably a reiteration of these patch notes are going to come out later today. Um, And so I'd like to talk about the first version, the 4.3.0 patch notes, so that we have the the full context to talk about the 3.1 or whatever the thing's going to be. Um, So that's that's the plan here. We'll talk about these. It may take a while. There's actually quite a bit here, uh, and a lot of it is a lot of it is fairly significant. So I don't. Um, I don't want to just gloss over everything. I mean, there will be some things I gloss over, but a lot of it is 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 noteworthy. Um, so just to remind you, we uh, we talked about this last time, but this is we're talking about the PTS for the Wrathstone DLC. It's coming out next month for PC, uh, which is just a it's just a dungeon pack. So a couple of dungeons that'll have four armor sets each, including monster sets. Uh, and there'll be some like collectibles and stuff like that. But then along with the dungeon pack, um, there's going to be a number of balance changes and set tweaks and stuff like the, the patch that comes along with the dungeon pack, um, is going to include a lot of, uh, a lot of changes to some stuff, some, some good, some bad, maybe we'll, we'll just have to see how things play out. Um, so uh so one so here's one thing to point out there's a new battleground map uh, called Eld Angvar looks like it's going to be like an alien themed thing so probably like alien architecture and that kind of stuff uh and there's going to be two versions of the map depending on what battleground mode you're playing so uh, capture the Rezo- capture the relic domination chaos ball will be on one variant of the map, and then Crazy King and Deathmatch will be on a different variant of the map. And they say like certain parts of the map will be closed off and inaccessible, depending on what mode you're in. So that'll be a new, interesting thing. Um, so new collectibles and outfit styles through PvP, uh, either through Cyrodiil uh, Rewards for the Worthy, um, Cyrodiil Vendor. Um, you can also get, like it looks like, weapon styles from Battlegrounds. Um, just like re- just from the rewards that you get from ba- doing battlegrounds. Interesting. Um, there are some updates to some of the Cyrodiil sets, some of the sets that you get as rewards for doing Cyrodiil uh, campaigns, uh, and some of these are quite interesting. Uh, we're gonna we'll spend a little bit of time on this. Uh, so first one is Deadly Strike. So uh, Deadly Strike currently is uh, just a three piece set. It comes in jewelry and weapons, uh, and the two-piece bonus gives you max health, and the three-piece bonus gives you crit, um, weapon crit. Now it's a five-piece medium armor set, um, and the jewelry comes in uh, robust now instead of healthy. Uh, and so now, uh, I'll just read down the set bonuses. Uh, two pieces gives you weapon damage, then you get weapon critical, then another weapon damage, and then the five-piece... Uh, increase your damage, increase the damage of your physical bleed, poison, and disease damage over time abilities by 14%. So basically any, just about any dot from a stamina build gets a 14% buff if you're wearing that set. Uh, So that's pretty strong. That seems crazy strong. We'll see. There's actually some, a few changes to some uh, of the weapon skill lines later that we'll keep that in check. Uh, and we'll see that here in a little bit. Next one, Buffer of the Swift. Uh, so currently you get 4% healing taken, you get max health, reduced damage from players by 5%, uh, and then the 5-piece 
When you take damage from a spell, you have a 10% chance to gain a damage shield that absorbs 2580 damage for 6 seconds. That can occur every 4 seconds. Um, and now the new rework is uh, you get max magicka, physical resistance, spell resistance, and then just a flat reduced damage taken from players by 10% as your 5 piece. So a total rework, uh, basically. Um, that's they made this set better, <laughs> plain and simple. The when you take damage from <clears throat> so the the old one or it's the current one when you take damage from a spell, so a magicka ability, you have a ten percent chance. So already a ten percent chance only for magicka based skills. It's a pretty low proc chance, and then you get a a twenty five eighty damage shield. I don't know if that tooltip there is reflecting uh, battle spirit or not. Uh, if not, then that's just a, a nothing shield. Just it's useless. Uh, even if that is reflecting battle spirit, that's a uh, not a large shield. I mean, I know it refreshes. It can refresh every four seconds if you're taking damage from a magic ability at that time. Um, but still, that's weak. Weak set. Um, now it's strong. The five piece, you just take 10% less damage from players all the time. No special when you take damage from this or anything. It's just temp players do 10% less damage to you, no matter what kind of attack they're doing. Um, I, I wonder if that counts tor uh, towards oblivion damage. I wonder if oblivion damage ignores that. Uh... I think those are probably pretty use useful stats here too. Max Magicka, physical resistance, spell resistance. So, like an all right tanking set, or even even like a light armor Magicka build. Just you want to be a little tankier, uh, but still have those light armor passives. Um, that could be that could be nice. <clears throat> could be real nice. Um, Alessian Order, uh, the old one, the current one, adds 129 stamina recovery, 4% healing taken, 1206 max health. Uh, and then the five piece, increase the immunity to disabling effects after using break free by three seconds. Uh, so someone disables you, you, you CC break for the next three seconds, you can't get another disabling effect. You, you can't be snared again or any of that. And they're changing that. Now it's going to be uh, physical resistance, spell resistance, max health, uh, and then increase your health recovery by 1% of your sum total physical and spell resistance. Hmm. So you take your physical resistance and your spell resistance, add them together, 1% of that number it gets added onto your health recovery. Uh, yeah, if you're, I guess if you're a tank with really high resistances, that that could be real nice. And get that get that health damage or that health recovery pumped up really high, uh, especially maybe if you're also running Troll King and those could stack on top of each other. Could be interesting. Seems weird. It's I mean it's a new thing. I don't think I've seen any other sets that are, you know, giving you a bonus like that. Uh, so it's just neat to see a a unique thing like that. Um, I wonder what people will find more useful. I, f I feel like that snare immunity in PvP is a nice thing to have, especially you know this is after this is after breaking free. The, the current version, after you break free, you gain immunity. So it's a situation where you're already taking heat. You're already being CC'd by someone. They're putting pressure on you, uh, and you break free. You at least have three seconds to breathe a little bit and maybe hopefully turn the tide. Uh, I tell you, if you're fighting a dragon knight, like a magic of dragon knight be a good set to have. Uh, so now you're trading that for this health recovery. And see the old set, that could be useful for anyone really. Just about just about anyone could put that set on and get good use out of it. And it seems like this new one, now you basically just need to be uh, a tank with high resistance to get usefulness out of that. Maybe there's some math I'm not understanding. Um, you know, we'll see. Maybe 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 some people will do some testing with that and, and make clarify some things this one's kind of interesting beckoning steel um, the current one you get spell resistance max health and spell resistance uh, and then for the five piece you have a 40 percent chance to intercept any projectile cast on an ally within five meters of you 
Uh, so like a PvP tank. Um, you're a tanky dude. You can take some hits. You have some squishy buddies nearby you. Well, if someone's shooting them with, with a, some kind of projectile, 40% chance that it, you'll just take that hit instead um, if they're within 5 meters of you, so they need to be close. Uh, they're changing that. The new version will have uh, spell resistance, max health, and physical resistance. Um, so balance, kind of rounding out those bonuses a little bit more. And then number five, you generate an aura that causes you and 11 group members within the aura to take 10% less damage from projectiles. You can only be affected by one instance of beckoning steel. So you can't have multiple people wearing this set and then you take 20, 30, 40% less damage. You're only going to get the the 10% less damage from projectiles. That's That's all you can get. That's interesting. It doesn't say, I wonder how big that aura is going to be. I mean, to hit 11 people, it's surely not going to be the same five meters that it, that it currently is because it's going to be hard to pack 11 people in that tiny little space, especially for an extended period of time. So hopefully it's pretty big, like maybe like a 28 meter thing. Or, you know, maybe that's too big, but, you know, big-ish would be nice. Uh, and then your group is just taking 10% less damage from projectiles. So snipes, might, that might be the difference between them surviving a snipe or not. Yeah, I could see that being useful, especially if it covers a big area. All right. Here's the one everyone's talking about. Curse Eater. Current version adds 1206 max health. 1096 max magicka, 129 magicka recovery, uh, and then the five piece reduces the duration of all negative effects applied to you by 20%. So that's being changed. Um, to two piece, you get max magicka, uh, and then the three and four piece both give you magicka recovery. So uh, you're, you're losing that health bonus uh, and basically getting a, an extra recovery in its place. And then the five piece, here it is. When you heal yourself or an ally, remove two negative effects from them. If a negative effect was removed this way, your target restores 150 magicka, and that can happen every two seconds. So I don't know how many of you guys do PvP on a regular basis, but uh, if you've spent any time there at all, you know that everybody has a heal over time, at least one heal over time ability ticking on them at all times. Um, so that's basically, if you're wearing this set, it's just an automatic, every, uh, an automatic cleanse every two seconds, all the time. You know, like in Cyrodiil, people are spamming mutagen left and right, that thing's going on everybody. You got people hitting vigor all the time, you have Templars putting down their extended ritual, uh, you know, a lot of people have rally. There's a lot of hots. Every single solitary player who is like not a total noob has at least one or two hots running constantly. So you put this set on, and you and then you just don't do anything different with your strategy. You just play the same way you always have, and you just have an automatic cleanse every two seconds. Someone hits you with poison injection, you you'll take two ticks of that, and then it's gone. Someone hits you with poison injection and rending slashes. You'll take two ticks of each, and then they're both gone. Templar hits you with um, power of the light. That doomsday clock starts ticking down. Well, don't worry. It's gone in two seconds. You get... Uh, what is it? The um, elemental drain... The debuff, it'll be gone in two seconds. <laughs> uh, that's too strong. That is too strong. People are outraged over this, I can tell you, and and rightly so. I, I usually try to at least kind of give these proposed changes a benefit of a doubt. Maybe there's just something that's not totally clear to me, and we'll, I'll see maybe later that it's not so bad. But this just seems like either a, a really bad oversight or, you know, someone lost an argument or something, uh, that's way too strong. That's, 
if this, if this goes live like this, and this will basically be a mandatory set for PvP, like you're gonna you're gonna have to wear that because uh, it's too good not to wear, I would think. Pretty wild, pretty wild. I'm thinking even if it only applied one negative effect, so it, it will remove two negative effects every two seconds. Even if it only applied, remove one negative effect like every five seconds, that's still super strong. You know, even if it only applied to yourself or, or you know, any kind of cleanse is, I feel like that's a special thing that you should have to work for and for it to come so easily like that every two seconds, two effects, um, way too strong, way too strong. That will need to get reworked uh, or that will, I don't know if it'll break PVP per se, but it'll, it'll definitely make it so that it's almost necessary to, for everyone to wear that, even, even if you're a stamina build. I mean, this is a magic set, but I could see it just that five piece being too good for even stamina builds to pass up. And, you know, a lot of stamina builds use Max Magicka and Magicka Recovery anyway. Um, so it might not even be a total waste, uh, those, those other set bonuses. So that'll have to get reworked, man. Uh, people in the forums are outraged about this. Um, the few streamers that I've watched, um, you know, cover this, these notes here are kind of in the same boat. Like the, the it seems crazy. It seems crazy. Um, and this stuff is flying out of guild traders. The curse, curse eater gear, um, had, the prices have shot way, way up. Uh, you basically can't get a hold of any now without, you know, just getting the drop from, from your Cyrodiil rewards. So we'll move on. That's, that's the biggie. We'll, we'll move on though. Sentry currently gives you max stamina, weapon damage, and weapon crit. And then the five piece increases the radius. You can detect sneaking enemies by 50%. And then it also increases your damage done to those sneaking, sneaking enemies by 20%, plus 129 weapon damage on that five piece. Um, now, um, you get max stamina, weapon damage, weapon critical. So the two, three, four hasn't changed. Um, number, then the five piece, when you begin to crouch, gain stealth detection for 10 seconds. This effect can only be activated every 30 seconds. That's that's a bit different. So the old five piece, it just you just increase the radius of detect. So you don't have to do anything. You just run around, sprint around, and you have that fifty percent increased uh, detection radius all the time. That five piece bonus is just giving it to you all the time. Um, now you actually have to do something. You got to hit that control key or whatever the controller equivalent equivalent is to 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 crouch. Now it says when you begin to crouch. So I don't think you actually have to go all the way into stealth. You just have to tap that control key to start going into stealth and then it starts that 10 second detection timer. And then after that 10 seconds is over, you have to wait another 20 seconds before you can do it again. Now I wonder if you can just stand right back up. Like you hit the control key and then hit it again and stand right back up and that 10 seconds of detection keeps ticking. I don't know. That's, I mean, that's a nerf for like a Nightblade hunter. You know, if you're like a ganker hunter and you're, you get a lot of enjoyment for, um, with pulling those dudes out of stealth and, and taking them out, um, it's going to be a little more difficult to do that now if you were depending on this set to do that. Uh, I think flavor wise, it probably kind of makes sense. If you're like a, if you're hunting a hunter, you know, then you yourself probably do need to be kind of stealthy and sneaky to, cause you're like tracking them down, you know? Um, so flavor-wise, it makes sense that you can't just be like, you know, put on rapids and sprint all over the place and have all this crazy uh, stealth detection. It seems like, you know, like in the real world, you would need to slow down and pay attention to your surroundings and stuff to be able to, to detect people. Um, so flavor-wise, that makes sense, but fun functional functionally, that's definitely a nerf, for sure. I think it's okay. I, I've never really, uh, personally, I've never really tried to be like a night blade hunter so it's not going to affect me but i know some people do really enjoy doing that and i, I could see that being fun because night blades can can be annoying all right that is 
that's the set changes for the Cyrodiil sets. Uh, I think most of these are pretty fine. Um, but that, uh, that Curse Eater, I'm sure they're getting some feedback on that. We'll see that, like I said, there we should be getting some new PTS notes later today. And I'm, I'm really hoping that Curse Eater has been addressed there. Um, that just seems like a very clear standout thing that, that, that it can't go to live like that. I'm, I'm amazed that it even made it to PTS like that, honestly. Um, oh, sorry. And with Sentry, uh, the new bonus, you still do have that extra 129 uh, weapon damage for, uh, additionally on that five piece as well. So you, you're not losing that. But you do lose the 20% damage done to sneaking enemies. So yet, yet again, a nerf. Not only do you ha not have that stealth detection all the time, you have to do something for it, and then there is a cooldown. Um, but then you also don't get that 20% damage uh, to those stealth enemies. I think that's probably fine. I mean, if, if you're tracking down a stealth enemy, uh, chances are they are a glass cannon night blade, and you're not going to need that 20%. Uh, to take them out, it's just going to take a, a few hits, and they're and they're gone, most of the time. Uh, and ten seconds, I think, probably is enough time. You know, if you like round a corner, you know, you're like running around a keep or something, and you round a corner and you see an enemy that suddenly vanishes into thin air, and okay, obviously that's a night blade, and they're probably like about to gank me. Uh, then you can tap your crouch button really quick. Ten seconds should be plenty of time to pull them out of stealth and. You know, either take them out or, you know, at least get your defenses up so that you don't get ganked. All right, moving on from sets. Um, they're uh, introducing a zone guide. So I guess we could call this an exploration buff. Um, so when you're just in the PvE zones, out, out in this, the regular game zones, um, when you look at the map, there's just new sort of objectives that they show you that their idea was like it's hard for especially like a somewhat inexperienced player there's so many options so many things to do you can get kind of paralyzed with indecision you don't know which direction to go and how you should prioritize things um, and so it looks like they're trying to help us out with that or help those players out with that kind of stuff and give you some suggestions on you know maybe some key objectives in each zone that you haven't completed yet that maybe maybe you want to touch on those things before moving on uh, and, and things like that. Um, you know, things like you haven't you haven't found all the way shrines in this zone or there are still some more main story quests here um, or you still have some delves left to do, some world bosses, uh, sky shards, um, that kind of stuff. Um, again, that's stuff that PC players um, can get from add-ons, um, but now it'll just be built right in. So those console players will have a nice little quality of life improvement. And again, if this is good enough, that allows me to uninstall an add-on um, for my PC uh, version of the game, then all the better. Fewer add-ons, the better, just for performance. Um, so that's cool. It's very cool. Uh, another quality of life improvement, especially for console players, and this is a big one, um, Guild Trader UI improvements. Uh, and I'm just going to straight up read these because every single one of these points is really awesome. Um, the Guild Trader interface has received a number of changes and new features in this update. Um, number one, item name search. Directly search for an item based on its name. Uh, name matching. Enter part of an item name. Sorry, entering entering part of an item name displays a list of all matching items. So you can still hone in on what you're looking for without knowing the complete name. Uh, and then it will save recent searches. Each, ser each search is saved and can be easily used again at any guild trader. Uh, and then there's also some new sorting options uh, and new kind of category and filtering options as well. So com console players are rejoicing, are rejoicing, right? Any console player who's heard about this, uh, um, who deals with guild traders with any kind of regularity, uh, tears of joy, I would say. Uh, if you're a PC player, PC players, again, we have add-ons to take care of this. We have an add-on called um, Awesome Guild Store, and it basically does all of these things that it's saying here. Um, but again, if this is implemented well enough that I can uninstall that add-on, few, fewer add-ons, the better. 
Absolutely. Uh, console players can. They don't. There is no add-on for console players. So, if you're if you're a PC player that's been using Awesome Guild Store, you know it, it's probably been a while, and you may have forgotten what the Guild Store is like without it. You know, you might just for just for the sake of experimentation, just disable that add-on. Disable Awesome Guild Store. Go visit a Guild Trader and just see what that UI is like. It is laughable. It's just it's like non-functional. I mean, like the number one item here that they're adding to the to the UI is item name search, right? That's the number one thing that they put that they're that they're adding here. So there is no item name search right now. Um, the sorting is really bad. It's it's really bad. It's like you have to be really dedicated to the task to find all the pieces that you're looking for. Find all the um, whatever potions or glyphs or whatever it takes a while especially if you're trying to put a whole build together like you just maybe you just got an alt to max level and now it's time to go get all the gear that you want you know sometimes i'll go straight to a guild trader and just buy all the pieces that i need um that's difficult to do without this awesome guild store add-on or without uh you know these ui improvements that are coming here it can take a while to get all that stuff and all the glyphs that you need and and all that um, so good deal there. That's, that's going to be such a nice thing. Um, moving on, there's two new houses. Uh, I, I normally wouldn't spend much time on this, but one of these are, uh, one of these is pretty interesting. Um, this Eleanor private arena, and it seems like it's kind of like a, a PVP themed house. Uh, it says, this remarkable home includes levers that activate various environmental hazards in the middle of the arena. Um, these hazards include uh, lightning, fire blast, and spinning blades, with each uh, each with their own distinct properties and behaviors. Uh, and they're saying this place was built by this pit fighting promoter guy in this private arena um, in these haunted ruins because the land was cheap and what could go wrong? <laughs> That's what it says. Um, so that's cool. It seems like maybe you and your buddies, maybe maybe you could invite someone to duel and then count to 10 and go find your starting positions. And then you have all these levers and hazards and stuff to mess with each other with. That'd be really cool. It'd be neat to see them take this a step further. I was watching um, a Fang Rush stream last week and he was, he was musing with an idea that I thought sounded really neat, which is if in player housing, in like in the housing editor, if they just gave you the option to toggle on aggression so that Basically, it's a PvP zone, and you can just – anyone who's in there, you can just attack people as though it was uh, PvP, uh, you know, without having to invite them to duel and all that sort of stuff. I could see player houses turning into these really awesome, like, death mansions, right, where you invite some guild mates or some friends to your player house, and you have, like, a five-player everybody versus everybody death match. Uh, and, you know, I know you've seen – some people get really elaborate with their their housing decoration, you know, and they'll use just like a thousand wooden planks to build some crazy thing that maybe you you, you couldn't imagine. Uh, so I can see some, pe some people really coming up with some interesting stuff for like a cool PvP death maze kind of environment uh, and then just toggle on aggression and invite some friends over and just go nuts beating each other up. Uh, and having these cool little secret passages and, and ways to hide uh, that could be that could be very very cool. Um, that's just z absolutely zero indication that anything like that is happening. That was just an idea that Fang Rush was saying, and uh, I, that's kind of that thought has stuck with me. That would be cool. I would like to see something like that. And it seems like it wouldn't be difficult to to code in if they wanted to, but. I could also see them having good reason to not want to do that because that would probably cut down on the battlegrounds activity quite a bit. So maybe that maybe that would be something they want to avoid. Actually, it's still a cool idea, right? This thing is cool if you're into crafting. Uh, writ ward writ <laughs> writ reward improvements. Um, so instead of only receiving materials from a lower tier than your crafting passive rank. You will now receive a distribution of materials with the majority of the materials being for your current material tier based on passive rank. So you're just getting higher level materials 
a, a higher concentration of materials that match your current rank. Um, so that's a buff, right? That's a crafting buff. You're going to be getting more valuable crafting materials um, as, a, as a reward for your crafting writs. That's very cool. Um, you will also receive a small amount of material for your next tier to allow you to stockpile a bit in advance. So when you rank up, you'll have time. You'll <laughs> you'll have the materials you need to keep going. So that's cool too. They kind of seed you a little bit of advance materials. Like if you're leveling up and you're not all the way to the top yet, they'll give you a little bit in advance. So when you do get there, you'll have some stuff to work with. And then you'll still receive a small amount of materials randomly chosen from a previous tier in order to support making equipment for your low, lower level characters. So they're just redistributing the proportion of valuable materials or higher level materials. That's a good thing. If you're, especially if you're a max level crafter, the vast majority of the time you're crafting for a max level character, I would say, or me anyway, the vast majority of the time. Uh, I'll occasionally maybe craft uh, some training gear for an alt that I'm leveling up or maybe for a friend or something, but uh, it's got to be at least 90% of the time that I'm crafting at CP 160 gear. So just to have even more of that level of mats coming in is definitely going to be a good thing. That stuff, that's going to motivate me to get my the rest of my alts crafting skills um, all leveled up so I can get in on that, that gravy train there. It's going to be real nice. All right, moving on from that... Let me scroll down here, scrolling, scrolling. A lot of just fixes and stuff like that. Okay, here's the next thing I have circled. So a uh, combat change, successfully, uh, successfully heavy attacking a target that is blocking will now provide half the resources instead of none. Um, so if you're doing a heavy attack and it would normally restore say 2000 stamina, if uh, if your enemy is blocking, then you're you're going to get one thousand stamina, uh, whereas currently you get zero. That's that's cool. I mean, that's that's a good thing for the player who's doing the heavy attack. Absolutely. Um, now I know that's going to disrupt some people's uh, PvP strategy. That's absolutely a strategy that people use to deny their opponent that resource return. Um, you know, if you're if you're clever about when when you block. You can um, you can kind of starve your opponent to where basically they're not getting enough resources back to keep fighting, and then and then you can just take them out, and they have no defenses left. That's a common strategy, and this is going to make that harder to do. Still, probably possible because you are they're only getting half the resources back, uh, but still they're getting something back. So uh, that strategy is going to be a little more difficult to pull off. Um. Another combat change, all pets will now inherit your bonuses and derived stats. So that means your critical hit chance, critical hit multipliers, champion points, and other percentage damage or healing amplifications uh, will be applied to any pet you summon. Now, item sets that summon pets will continue to not inherit your critical strike chance. But I think they still will be affected by CP and other stuff. So pet stork buff, big time. Big time pet sork buff, um, or like a warden with a bear. That's cool. I mean, it's cool for the pet sork. It's uh, in PvP. I can tell you, pet sorks are already a pain to deal with. Even you know, and their pets really barely do it. They their pets don't do enough damage to really concern yourself with right now. But they're just a nuisance because they 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 make it difficult to actually land a hit on the sork. Now, you know, that'll still be the case. It's difficult to land a hit on the Sork, but also they're going to be dealing a lot more damage, so they're going to be a lot more of a problem now. And you get these Zookeeper Sorks and Battlegrounds that are running around with, like, you know, five pets at the same time. Um, you know, it's already a madhouse. And sometimes groups will group up, and you'll have you'll have uh, four pet Sorks, and it's just a madhouse, and there's, like, nothing anyone can do. And they don't even have to really be great PvPers. You know, they just have their pets running around and they can just like kind of heavy attack everyone from them just standing in the center of their little pet army. No one can land a hit on them. And meanwhile, they're they're just dishing out damage. And so now that now their pets are just going to be helping that, them out even more. That's going to be a, that's probably going to be a nuisance uh, for 
anyway, for people like me who <laughs> don't like dealing with pet sorks or zookeeper sorts, at least I don't mind a pet sork if they have like one or two pets. I feel like I can deal with that. Um, you start getting more pets than that, especially mul multiple players in a group with multiple pets. It's uh, a lot to deal with. So that'll be interesting to see how that turns out. All right, next change. Um, enchantments on one-handed weapons will now be half the potency of those placed on two-handed weapons. This will apply to the damage and, effect and effectiveness of a chance, but not the cooldown. So the cooldown will stay the same. Um, most, most of the comments I've seen are basically like, yeah, seems fair. <laughs> you know, it probably should be that way. Um, what I'm curious about is if you choose, like if you do, if you're thinking like, man, I wish I could just get the full potency of just this one glyph, you know, and I'd be willing to give up having two glyphs on my front bar. It'd be cool if they let you do that. If you could put two of the same glyph on each, uh, one handed weapon and allow them to stack so that you can get that full value as if you really just had one single glyph, um, no indication that that's the plan, but I think that'd be neat just to give the players that option. Right now, if you have two glyphs of the same type uh, equipped on the front bar on your dual wield, uh, they do not stack. So unless they change that, that, that will not be the case. And so you'll basically, that just basically won't be a good option to have two of the same glyph. You'll definitely want to have a, two different kinds of glyphs. But I'd like to have that as an option, especially like if you, if, you know, you really are relying on that absorb stamina glyph for your sustain um and this is going to make that dif more difficult you know you you'd have that choice of just equipping two of those uh glyphs and get that still get still get that full sustain so we'll see if I'd, i'm thinking that probably won't be how it turns out but we'll see some changes to major or some changes to buffs and debuffs uh there's there's a bunch of skills that were their damage was, was being reduced by major and minor evasion and they didn't intend for that to be the case so they basically just changed that so uh, just a quick rundown uh, force pulse overwhelming surge radial uppercut selenes sheer venom shrouded daggers bounce damage uh, trap beast and uh, unfathomable darkness uh, evasion was reducing the damage by those things and now it will not those things will still do their their normal damage as if evasion was not there and then abilities that provide major buffs that are not associated with healing or damage will now apply to a maximum of 12 targets uh, and and here's the abilities that that affects frost cloak will now hit 12 targets instead of just six so a buff there molten weapons for the dk affects 12 targets instead of six so you get more people there it's good uh, rapid Maneuver now affects 12, star 12 targets instead of 24, so half the number. Uh, and same thing with Warhorn, 12 instead of 24. Um, so um, basically maybe trying to break up those Zergs a little bit, um, especially like Rapid Maneuvers. If it's only hitting 12 people, I guess that's just increasing the chance that some of your people in your zerg ball might fall behind a little bit and just kind of spread that fight out a little bit more maybe or it'll just require that more people in that group slot rapid maneuvers which kind of forces them to have a little bit less fighting power you know if they're wasting a slot for that um so i don't know that's interesting um I wonder if that's the motivation there is to get rid of Zergs or to or to help break up Zergs a little bit. Not sure. All right, moving on. So this one's kind of a big deal. There's some uh, changes to uh, some of the Sorcerer uh, stuff, and people have been talking about this. Let's just get into it here. Um, updated the tooltips for all summon abilities to better indicate the damage or healing they provide. So as we were talking about just now, uh, Pets just got a big buff. So they're just updating the description of those abilities to, to tell you exactly how much damage and stuff they're going to do. Um, boundless Storm uh, and... Yeah, the Boundless Storm morph, um, the cost was reduced by 34%. It's just much cheaper. That's the only difference. It still does the same thing, just costs way less. 
Uh, and here's here's the what. This is the big change to Sork that uh, that has people talking. All right, it's the implosion passive, uh, and it's just as a reminder. Uh, currently, implosion it's a passive, and what it does is it gives all shock spells a if it's max if it's maxed out, it has a six percent chance to instantly d disintegrate low health targets, dealing ten thousand shock damage. I think low by low health they mean f under fifteen percent. I think. 10,000 shock damage. So it's like a backup execute. Um, and then and then there's a physical damage version of the same thing. So if you do shock damage, you have a, a chance to disintegrate, and physical damage has a chance to pulverize for 10,000. I think it's the same thing, still 10,000 physical damage. Um, that's kind of a signature... Sork thing, right? You get down into uh, execute range. You're fighting a Sork, and you get in, down into execute range. It's probably going to be over, right? Because they have that Mage's Wrath that's just so super strong already. Um, and if somehow you survive the Mage's Wrath, you got there's a six percent chance that this implosion is just going to finish the job with the Sork not doing anything else uh, at all. Uh, and it says, you know, gives all shock spells. Uh, a six percent chance to do that. So you know, if they have some dots ticking on you, so so they say so they hit you with that mage's wrath, and you're not quite dead yet, but you have like two like lightning dots on you, like a crushing shock and liquid lightning, or like just a, I think even like a shock a lightning stuff heavy attack would count. Then all those things ticking away actually increases the chances of this thing proccing quite a bit. So it's not just six percent chance that that's going to happen. It might be more like a, you know, a twelve or eighteen percent chance. Um, so now that's that's going away now. It's it's no longer called implosion. It's now after P, after this patch goes live, it's going to be called amplitude. Um, and this passive is now a reverse execute mechanic and increases your damage against targets by one percent for every ten percent health they currently have. Uh, so that's a mouse mouthful, but uh, basically the idea is the more health your target has, the more damage you do to them. So when you first initiate a fight, say your, your target has 100% health, right? They haven't taken any damage. Then you just flat have a 10% boost to your damage against them. Um, just right out of the gate, you ha you, your sorcerer will do 10% more damage than they currently do to, to targets with full health. And then for every every 10% of health that they lose, you do a little bit less, you, you lose some of that 10% buff, right? And it goes down to, as they get, as your target gets down to 1% uh, health, um, then at that point, you are, you're just doing one per, back to 1% or back to, uh, yeah, it's just a one percent damage increase that you're getting at that point, right? So you're not you're not doing any less damage as a sorcerer than you were before. At no point are you doing less damage. You're just you start out with that ten percent buff from the get go, and then that ten percent buff gradually goes away as your as your target um, loses health, uh, and then you and then you don't have that implosion that that that's going to kick in at the fifteen percent, or that has a chance to kick in at the fifteen percent. Um, so I think for um, a Magicka sorcerer, probably not a very big deal at all. Your Mage's Wrath is already so uh, so strong. If somehow your target survived your Mage's Wrath, then just hit him with another Mage's Wrath, and it's over. You know that that's. that's that's all there is to that. Sorks have so much burst already, uh, a crazy amount of burst. And now their burst is just going to be even stronger because most likely, you know, the majority of the fight, you're above 15% health. So that implosion, you know, isn't even relevant a lot of the time. Um, so I think that's, I think that's going to be fine for a magic, a sorcerer. I could see for a stamina sorcerer, um, you know, they don't have Mage's Wrath, and if they're not using a two-hander, you know, they don't really have an execute of any kind. So having that implosion kind of 
gave them some sort of an execute sort of kind of. That's interesting. I know I know some people are, of course, not happy to lose that implosion because it, when it when it procs, it's super powerful. Um, I think in PvE on boss fights, this is 100% a buff. Whether you're a mag sork or uh, or a stam sork, I mean, if for 85% of the fight you're you're doing more damage, you know, and then the last 15% that that phase of the fight's going to be over in seconds, you know. So the the DPS loss there is, I think, probably pretty irrelevant. But I can see that being a nerf in PvP. If you're relying on that to be kind of part of your execute, uh, and that and that's the difference between you you landing that fatal blow or not, um, you know, I, I I could understand being upset about losing that. Definitely, I think overall, I think Sorks will still be fine though. I really do. Um, they're they're super strong, and like I said, they already have lots of burst. That'll probably that'll hit Stam Sorks a little harder than it does Mag Sorks, but I think they'll still survive it. Templar, uh, Solar Barrage will do 10% more damage now. Uh, and now during, while, while it's active, you have an infinite Empower bonus. And I think before it only, you only got Empower every two seconds. Now you, I guess just every light attack you do is Empowered. Um, I think this ability lasts six seconds. So you got six seconds of all the Empower you can handle. That's pretty cool. It's it'd be neat. It'd be even better if Templar's main spammable wasn't a channeled ability and it was just like a one second cast time, so you can get you can get more of those light attack weaves in and get really get a lot out of that empower. Um, but I guess you still you have the option to use elemental weapon or force pulse if you want to. But then, like, are you really a Templar at that point? All right, moving along. Just some stuff some people are talking about, some changes to uh, some weapons. So uh, two-handed heavy weapons, uh, the heavy weapons passive, um, they reduced the bleed applied from Axe version of this passive by approximately 12%. Uh, and then they increased the damage bonus from the sword version of this passive to 6%. It's currently 5%, so raised that up to 6 um, so the Axe Bleed, Axe Bleed's got a nerf. And you remember one of the Cyrodiil armor sets we talked about earlier gives a either a 12 or a 14% bonus uh, to, to stamina dots. So it's basically, that set is basically giving you that nerf back, basically. Bleeds are super heavy. In PvP, bleeds bleeds are a lot to deal with. So I'm, I'm not mad about that. Um, I'm sure some people will be. And then they did the same thing to dual wield. Uh, the twin blade and blunt passive reduced the bleed applied from the axe version by 12%. Uh, and then the bonus from swords, um, they gave that a 3% per sword equipped, um, 3% bonus to damage done. It's currently, I think, a 2.5% per sword. So a little bit of a sword buff to both dual wield and two hand. Um, but they just fixed some stuff. Um, destruction staff, ancient knowledge. I'm, I'm excited about this. Removed the requirement of having a destruction staff ability slotted to gain the effect of the passive. Now you simply need to equip a destruction staff and the bu the the buff you want to gain the bonus it provides. Oh, you need simply need to equip the destruction staff of the buff you want to gain the bonus it provides. It's a very strange phrasing. But anyway, long story short, that ancient knowledge passive, the way it is right now, you have not you have to equip a Destro Staff and you also have to slot a Destro Staff skill on that bar. And if you swap to your back bar and there's no Destruction Staff skill slotted there, even if you have a Destro Staff equipped, then you lose that ancient knowledge passive until you go back to your front bar where you have a, a, a skill slotted. Um, so now you just have to have the Destro Staff. As long as you have a Destro Staff, you have the Ancient Knowledge passive. You don't have to slot a single Destro skill, uh, and you still get that passive. So that's that's really great. That really frees up some um, some possibilities as far as how, how you can set your bars up. Um, gives you a lot a lot of new options. So I like that a lot. Um, 
Moving on, Sigic Order, Imbue Weapon. Uh, the resource return from failing to consume this ability will now only return a portion of the resources rather than all of them. Um, fix an issue where you could get more resources back than you had originally cast it with when used in tandem with sources of cost reduction. I know some PvP builds had figured that out, and we're actually using Imbue Weapon not as a spammable ability, but just as a stamina regen method basically because there's this weird I don't know if you can call it a bug or just like a mathematical oversight but um, you know they were basically just using that as a sustain tool uh, which is not what it was intended for so they, they fixed that Rapid Maneuvers was changed. Um, the ability in its morphs will no longer provide immunity to snares or immobilizes. And that's a big change especially so it also if you remember, it only applies to 12 targets instead of 24 now, also. So it's it's been nerfed a little bit. Uh, and then the retreating morph uh, no longer will remove current snares or immobilizes. And instead, it gives you uh, a bonus that makes you take 15% less damage from behind. <laughs> so, so it's truly living... It's, it's being true to that name, retreating maneuver. It's a situation where... You are retreating, you are running away, and you are taking damage from behind, uh, and uh, it's reducing that damage by 15%. But, I mean, you don't get that immunity to snares or immobilizes, so what, someone just has to throw caltrops out in front of where you're running to, and they're just going to catch right up to you, and that 15% reduction from behind is not really going to matter. I don't know. I mean, I'm sure there will be situations where it does matter, but I definitely would. I definitely would take that CC immunity back any day. Absolutely. Um, so I don't know. We'll see. I wonder. I mean, it seems like they're kind kind of trying to break up Zerg balls a little bit. Seems to be the overall kind of goal there. What else? I think that's all the important stuff. Yeah, everything else is just like kind of fixes and uh, things like that. So that's the important stuff for the PTS notes that we did not talk about last week. Uh, you know, the racial balance changes are in here too, but we, we covered those, I think, uh, good enough uh, last time. Um, so like I said, they're going to probably release the 4.3.1 uh, patch notes. I'm thinking today. They may already be up. Let me see. And then once they, once those are up, we'll do another recording and just talk about what's changed since 3.0. All right. I think we're going to call that an episode. I mean, we got a uh, little bit of everything out of these patch notes. We had some set discussion, a little bit of theory crafting, a little bit of news. Um, you know, these batch notes really kind of make a podcast about this sort of thing easy because you just kind of read them, say what you think, and before you know, an hour has passed. <laughs> um, and like I said in the first episode, I'm going to be playing around with the format. You may have noticed this time I didn't have like clearly defined segments. Uh, I just kind of had some stuff I wanted to talk about. And uh, I listen to some other podcasts that that's how they do it, and I like those well enough. And so, you know, I may try that out for size, and we may find that that's better than having kind of clearly defined st structured things. I might just, you know, throughout the week, jot things down that I want to talk about and then just whip out my notes when it's time to, when it's time to record. Cause this felt pretty nice actually. Um, not having that, that rigid structure that I was trying to follow the first time. Uh, so we'll see how that goes. Anyway, that'll be it for this episode and um, I'll see you again soon.